Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to present today. So, as you've already said, I'm going to talk about nitrosamines. I'm going to talk about it from the context of where we are at the moment and that critical question in terms of and nitrosamines is the worst over is that regards to this. So, what is the uh, current position in regards to nitrosamines? So, I'm just trying to get the slide to advance here. It doesn't want to play ball at the moment. Okay. Okay, that's playing ball now. So, for people who've been involved in this area, cognizant with it, you will know that for the last three or four years, we've been concerned over N nitrosamines, really uh, since the advent of issues regarding nitrosamines, which was triggered by the Barsatan incident. What that ultimately led to was a request, pretty much on a global basis across all the major health authorities, to carry out a nitrosamine risk assessment across all chemical and eventually biological molecules. And in terms of the chemical entities, the first stage of that risk assessment, the step one assessment, looking at your chemistry and your formulated product and determining whether or not you believe that you have a potential risk of nitrosamines, that particular exercise was completed in March 2021. So just over or just under a year ago uh, since that date. And in terms of progress at that point, really good progress was made. Pretty much every organization was able to provide details, at least on the basis of risk or no risk at that particular uh, point in time. So we saw a very high level of uh, completion as, as regards that. And any gaps identified at that time, I think have subsequently been addressed. But one of the critical questions was out of all of that, how many products actually reflected a risk? And actually, what we saw was that somewhere between five to 10% of all products were at the end of that step one process, actually defining a risk. And there were also questions even at that point as to um, how people were approaching that from the point of view of, were they carrying out a detailed risk assessment against the principles, for instance, of ICHQ9 uh, that took into consideration all the uh, relevant knowledge around nitrosamines at that point, or were organizations just reporting a potential risk and looking to simply screen the nitrosamines? With that latter approach in particular being a concern because no analytical screening could look for all of the different nitrosamines that are potentially proper, uh, uh, present, particularly those that relate to the formulated uh, product itself. As you will see as I go through this, that becoming arguably now the biggest and most dominant factor in terms of nitrosamine related risk. So, what did we know and what did we learn? Well, what did we learn from step one was that it is unfortunately possible to generate N nitrosamines as a consequence of the chemistry you employ. And this was indeed was the root cause of the situation regards Balsatan, where a change was made to that process, replacing a particular uh, reagent, so tributartin azide was replaced by sodium azide, and the solvent was also changed in that from xylene to DMF. And because of the consequence of the high reactivity of sodium azide, the quenching agent had to be employed. The most common one for that purpose is sodium nitrate. And what was not realized at the time of the variation, but actually when this was first reported, was several years after that variation, that unfortunately in the situation with Valsartan in the final bond forming step, we essentially as an industry created the almost idealized conditions to generate an N nitrosamine. And what we know in regards to the, uh, the chemistry is that basically a source like sodium nitrite, uh, you have the nitrite anion, the uh, acidic conditions that will generate nitrous acid and the nitrosal cation, and that can react uh, with secondary uh, alkyl amines and generate an N nitrosamine. And indeed, in the case of Balsartan, the secondary amine concerned was. Um, was dimeth uh, dimethylamine, which was present as an impurity in the uh, DNA, DMF, and indeed was also a decomposition product. And as we start to understand more about this, we suddenly realized as well that there was an article here that pointed to the fact that we were also seeing contamination of products with N nitrosamines as a consequence of operations into, uh, like solvent recycling and catalyst recycling, where poor GMP was employed. So, Already we start to see a widening of that issue. But what have we learned? Well, one of the things we have learned is that for this particular reaction between a secondary amine and a nitrosating agent, 
that there are a number of factors that are critical in regards to this. And indeed, this work that I'm showing here relates to a very in-depth investigation that we carried out on this, where we look particularly at the risk of nitrites coming from processed water. So this particular paper now allows us to put that risk into context. You know, we have actual data on nitrite levels in potable water and in purified water. In that paper as well, we did a detailed review of the literature, including mechanisms of nitrosation. Kinetic modeling was done. And also as well, we looked at all of the various factors that could influence this. This included factors like concentration of nitrite, water volume, what the amine and the uh, concentration was as well, the PKA of the amine temperature, various factors that could all influence this. And what we learned was that this was the first opportunity to understand, at least from a chemistry point of view, what we could do to control the risk of N-nitrosamines. And this schematic shown uh, that illustrates the key principles of the paper shows that where you have a high amount of nitrite, as was the case in Valsartan, because you'd introduced sodium nitrite in a stoichiometric amount to quench the sodium azide, and you have a trace of a secondary amine, then that, unfortunately, is a very rapid reaction to generate and nitrosamines, and we can kinetically model that. Really importantly as well is where you're talking about a trace of nitrite and a trace of a secondary amine, which is a scenario you're going to see very commonly in many processes. In that scenario, there is virtually no risk, and certainly no risk in the context of actual levels. So that's an important development. We also learned other things as well. In, another thing that we learned was the fact that we could also see nitrosamines come from another source. We could see this being associated with the drug product from the point of view of the packaging, that packaging-related risk relating to the fact and use of nitrocellulose-based living foils. What you have in effect with, nit uh, with those living foils is that you have a nitrosating agent in the form of NOx species that could be generated when, basically, when you seal the blister pack. Where does that come from and where does the risk come from? Well, the material itself is nitrocellulose, and when you eat it, you can generate those NOx species. And what they can do is they can react with secondary amines that are present within the inks. So when you label the, uh, the blister pack and print on the top of it, then those, uh, that print is basically um, contains low levels of secondary amines, low molecular weight secondary amines like dimethylamine. You create, again, a scenario where you can generate N-nitrosamines. And this was perhaps the first example of where we had to think about uh, the, the overall extent of the risk. What we've been able to accurately show is that in a very worst case scenario, you could probably generate something like one nanogram of nitrose or dimethylamine NDMA per blister, uh, blister uh, cap, uh, pocket, basically. And so given the limit is 96 nanograms per day, then that means worst case scenario, you'd have, well, you'd have to take 96 capsules uh, to actually reach the actual limit for NDMA, which is 96 nanograms per day. How likely is that? Well, extremely unlikely. Should we be therefore phasing out uh, nitrocellulose as a packing material? Well, I mean, I don't think that is, a, uh, is something that I would necessarily certainly recommend in the first instance for an existing product. But for new products, it may well be expedient to replace nitrocellulose-based packing material. So that's another key lesson we've learned. But the other lesson that we learned was that it didn't just stop at the sartans and it didn't just stop at cross-contamination and it didn't even uh, stop at packaging. All of a sudden, we got reports in 2019 of seeing another product contaminated, in this case, uh, ranitidine or Zantac, the trade name. And this related to an altogether different scenario where there was an intrinsic weakness in the molecule where it was possible to actually intramolecularly generate NDMA through the decomposition of ranitidine, and that actually was ultimately found to relate to the crystal form um, of the, of the um, ranitidine in this particular case. What that led to was then that call for a much wider investigation of all of this. And what this slide shows here is a detail of some of the time timelines as regards this, and the inexorable increase in number of products that we found to be contaminated, or at least potentially contaminated, with and nitrosamines, and one of the most recent ones being varenicline, the anti -cessa uh, smoking cessation uh, drug, which has again seen widespread withdrawal of that. Other major products like metformin have been impacted by this as well. One of the things to also note as we 
move along that chronology is, is that the type of nitrosamine we're seeing is moving from small molecular weight n nitrosamines that were seen as a consequence of the chemistry employed in the API manufacture, now through into n nitrosamines that are product like that, uh, where the drug itself is a secondary amine and we're generating n nitrosamines for it. So we're seeing that subtle shift in the type of nitrosamines that we're seeing. So what are the quality challenges and what are the safety challenges as regards this? Well, I mean, in terms of the quality challenge, I've already, you know, I've already described this, particularly in the context of API manufacturing. You know, we now understand that there is that amine vulnerability and that it relates to factors such as the type of the amine and the PKA and things like that. We know that nitrite chemistry is not widespread. We don't, you know, aside from its use, for instance, as a quenching agent, as far as the Balsartan process was concerned and in use in Sandmeyer chemistry, nitrites per se are not used widespread in chemistry as a reagent. But we do know we have presence in, of nitrite in water. How big is that risk? Well, I mean, hopefully now through that paper and work that I've already described, we now get a much better understanding and control as far as this is concerned. Indeed, what we can do is actually calculate this. We can model all of this. But even then, we run into further challenges from the point of view, will regulators accept those in silico communications or will we always be dry uh, driven to actually measure levels of any nitrosamine that may be generated? And indeed, can we take further consider into further consideration factors like the fate of a nitrosamine? What happens if a nitrosamine is generated in the process four or five steps back in the synthesis? You would expect, like any reactive chemical, the potential to purge it in the downstream process. We can model that through tools like Mirabilis. You know, it was mentioned in the introduction, my own interest in that particular area. But again, you know, we have these regulatory challenges as to whether or not these calculations will be accepted as part of the modeling of the risk. I've already said we understand the formation of nitrosamines, particularly from a chemistry point of view. I'm not going to go through any of these steps here other than to make a note of the fact that this understanding really goes all the way back to the 1960s. We've known about nitrosamine formation for a very long period of time. And we know about the kinetics, the mechanism that's involved, and also where the maximum rate is, and the maximum rate being at around pH 3.15. So what can we do with this? Well, what we can do with it, we can model it. We can model the trace trace, the uh, scenario, which is uh, where you've got a nitrosation reaction that's contaminated uh, with uh, traces of a secondary amine. So this is where a mole equivalent of of a nitrosating agent, but only a trace of the secondary amine. That's the Valsartan scenario. That's where we see rapid formation of an N-nitrosamine, in that case, NDMA. What happens though when you have the, uh, the alternative? So you have, for instance, a secondary amine with a trace of nitrite present. Well, that's more of an intermediate risk and something you look at on a case-by-case -case basis. The levels that will be formed are significantly lower. And critically, we can model it from the point of view of where we have trace trace so what is the outcome of all of this well the outcome is we could say that you're going to get complete conversion in the scenario where you've got a mole equivalent of a nitrosating agent of any traces of the secondary amine 74 mg in 60 minutes against limits of 96 nanograms per day that's why you had a problem with valsartan what about trace trace well significantly lower levels over a much longer period of time but still there is that risk well, in the case of trace trace, which is where we are the majority of times, we should have virtually no risk, 19 nanograms formed over 115 days. So this is really important because it allows us to put that risk into some form of uh, context. And all of that was covered in this particular paper by Ashraf Uthar, which was referenced on one of the earlier slides. So we can say that there's significant risk, moderate risk, low risk. I want to go back to another point about uh, you know, looking at the risk as far as nitrosamines are concerned. Can we, can we use purge calculations? Well, this recent survey showed that for control of mutagenic impurities, the vast majority of the control of mutagenic impurities exercised through ICHM7 control limits, and in particular, option four, purge calculations. 70% of all control strategies based on purge calculation. But what about N nitrosamines? Well, admittedly, there's less data around nitrosamines, from the point of view of, of uh, their reactivity and purging, but we are working on this as far as the Mirabilis tool is uh, concerned. And indeed, where there is an absence of data in, a, in Mirabilis, 
then it would predict no reaction. And so from that point of view, we can be sure that at the moment at least, that Hertz calculations would be conservative in regards to this. And as we generate more data and understanding and build it into these PERCH tools, we can more accurately measure and, monitor and predict the formation of nitrosamines and their downstream decomposition. And indeed, in terms of, um, as far as at least predicting whether or not they would have an issue, we published another paper relatively recently where we looked at a candor sartan, which is another sartan, but with a very different risk profile. It's very difficult to go through this in any uh, detail with the time available, but the point was by looking at and predicting the purge of the precursors, so the secondary amines or the DMF, which could be the source of the secondary amines, and also predicting the purge of nitrite, we could easily demonstrate that we had effective control over the inputs into any nitrosation type chemistry, and indeed could predict that we would not form NDMA in that particular process. And ultimately, we were able to provide the analytical data to back this up as well. So, you know, for Candace Sartan, PERS calculations said within AstraZeneca, at least, with under an hour after we became aware of the risk, that we didn't think Candace Sartan had the same risk profile as false Sartan. So, you know, extremely useful and powerful to use these tools. And indeed, our scientific understanding is increased still further by understanding the, uh, the purging of nitrosamines through uh, partitioning as well. So a lot of scientific data now being generated that allow effective control of nitrosamines. But of course, then there's the analytical challenge. And we know, as I've already said, a significant number of products, significant in terms of at least 10% of all the capacity, needed that analytical testing at the end of the step one uh, process. So we're now having to generate an awful lot of analytical data as far as nitrosamines is uh, concerned. Now, most of that's come about because we've now discovered the fact that we have that latent risk in many of our drugs. Where a drug is a secondary amine, there is that very real risk of nitrosation. And that is really starting to impact on us and mean many more of our products have that risk associated with it. So then you might think, well, okay, that's fine. Go away and uh, just do that testing. What does that mean? Well, the testing itself is incredibly difficult and challenging. You know, we're talking about parts per billion in many levels. We're talking about high-end mass spectrometry, LCMS, MS, GCMS, MS, equipment that's not available routine in quality control environments. We need reference standards of complex nitrosamines as well that don't exist. We have to make them synthetically. Not only do we need to be able to detect down to the acceptable level, some of the regulations push you to have to control to below 10% of that level. So there are analytical challenges, not just from a technical point of view, but a capacity point of view as well. One product alone, metformin, requiring testing on a global basis, thousands of products per year. And of course, you know, just to expand further on this, we have that significant challenge where we're looking for an analyte at a very, very low level and present in an environment, i.e. in the drug product, where we have the complex scenario with the excipients and the API and other things like that. And we run that risk, it says here, of false positives and false negatives. In many cases, it's a case by case basis with bespoke sample preparation. And in that case, you know, one off testing to confirm risk or no risk is very different to having to do this on a long term basis. And indeed, this just gives an example of the fact that, you know, in the, one of the things that has been regularly seen is misidentification. NDMA is isobaric with one of the isotopes of, uh, of DMF. And what that means is that unless you're using, either you know, doing deliberate fragmentation to be able to uh, come up with a daughter ion that you can track or using accurate mass, then often it's possible to overestimate, particularly NDMA, by confusing it with a trace of NDMA. I've already said as well, one of the challenges now is that we're seeing N-nitrosamines of drugs themselves. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons for that is because we see nitrites and excipients. We're having to build up that understanding of the level of nitrites therefore and excipients and we're doing that through a data sharing exercise what that's showing is that we do indeed see nitrites in excipients at significant levels significant when you're talking about forming 18 and uh, 18 parts per billion 18 nanograms rather of a you know of a second of a uh, nitrosamine so parts per million of a nitrite will ultimately present a risk in that context. And we have to be cognizant and aware of that. So that's another challenge we're now facing. And that is the case for something like 20% of all drugs run that latent risk. 
We also need to manage multiple nitrosamines. Originally, how this was done was done in a way that suggested if you saw two nitrosamines, you would have to control them to whatever the lowest of the limits is. Well, I've tried to give an example of the problems with that here. Nitrosal capericine, the safety limit for that is 808.78 um, micrograms per day, not nanograms, micrograms. So significantly higher than the 26 nanograms, for instance, of NDEA. But if you had nitrosal capericine present, and you had nitrosal diethylamine present, then the regulation said, oh, well, you have to control both to 26 nanograms per day. Really impractical to do that. And just very recently to show the rapidity of the way things change in this area, the regulations have now come back and said, we can take an alternative approach to this. What do you do if one of those nitrosamines is less than 10%? Well, we're now seeing some sensible pragmatism from regulators as regards this. That question, if you've got one below 10%, do both need to be taken into consideration? Well, actually now the reality is no, you don't. We can take this uh, approach now, this alternative too, of saying in that particular case, if I have two nitrosamines, the biggest risk being MDMA in my particular scenario, but I have a theoretical at least possibility of NDA being present as well, no longer do I need to control it to 26 nanograms per day, the limit for NDEA. I can rule out NDEAs not being of any significance. Why? Because it's below 10%. This definitely improves things, but it's taken a long time to get to this point. And we have safety challenges as well. You know, are all n nitrosamines a concern? We understand the mechanistic pathway for n nitrosamines. Nitrosamines are not direct alkylating agents, they have to undergo metabolism. And it all re uh, relates to enzyme, um, you know, enzyme oxidation in an alpha hydroxy position. If we don't have an alpha, hydro alpha hydrogen, it can't ultimately form the species of real concern, the diazonium ion. So does that mean if you don't have an alpha hydrogen, you have no risk? And also as well as the question of the potencies. Potencies vary massively. We start at NDEA at 26 nanograms per day the nitrosamine of diethylamine. But by the time we're getting to things like nitrosal perversing, where you have a, a relatively rigid ring stru uh, structure, 8.78 micrograms per day, not nanograms, more than a hundred fold difference. So what is the limit you set for a nitrosamine? And indeed, some of the nitrosamines of the APIs are not, uh, it's, uh, are not even carcinogenic. It's demonstrated here, particularly with this example of cimetidine. So what is an appropriate limit and what is the risk very, very difficult to define. We have acceptable intakes defined by the regulations, but these only apply to the simple low molecular weight N nitrosamines. They don't apply to the API like nitrosamines, which are by far the most common ones that we now see. So then it begs the question, you know, ultimately as well, often what is the correct limit? Well, even for the ones that are covered by that table, taking the example of this nitrosamine here. Uh, NMPA, nitrosomethylphenylamine, the EMA limit is 34.3 for that. FDA limit is 26.5, but the carcinicity data says it's 106. So, you know, what is the right value? And if you think that, you know, can't even get clarity across the, the same molecule, across the different guidances, what chance do you have if you're trying to postulate a limit for a novel end nitrosamine? And certainly it begs the question, is 18 nanograms the default limit defined by Europe, you know, appropriate, particularly for high molecular weight API like nitrosamines, means when many of those we've now synthesized and carry out an AIMS test. And the negative. So, you know, 18 nanograms in that scenario really doesn't make any scientific sense. And indeed, even the fundamental safety test that we use to look at this, the AIMS test being used for 70 years has been challenged about the use of the AIMS test generally for nitrosamines based on historic literature data around the choice of solvent, what activating agent that you use, and even how you actually run the test itself, pre-incubation versus direct plate incorporation, with some regulators even saying we cannot uh, accept an AIMS test anymore to prove a nitrosamine is either active or not. Transgenic studies have even been talked about, but these studies take you know, over a year to do, they cost a million and a half dollars and the capacity issues. So, you know, we have this real issue at the moment where regulators are saying, well, the safety test we've used for 50 years may not be appropriate to nitrosamines. Yet the alternative 
is simply not viable from a practical point of view. And indeed, as industry has pointed out, the data doesn't even support the regulatory position on this. The, regulator, the actual data we got showed a very clear correlation between uh, between nutricity costlicity for nitrosamines far better than for other genotoxic compounds. So, you know, from that point of view, the argument really that we need to find an alternative aim seems flawed. So, where does this leave us? Well, where it leaves us at the moment is we're in the middle of a large amount of additional work doing analytical testing. And we're already talking about having real capacity challenges on this. There's the major challenges from the safety side of things, particularly around the AIMS test, with a huge amount of uncertainty on this. But let's not get away from the fact that where we're talking about nitrosamines forming from the drug itself, 20% of all pharmaceuticals at the moment are secondary amines. If you're forming a nitrosamine in every single one of them, and that's entirely possible, how are we going to resolve this if we're relying on analytical testing alone and we can't carry out safety testing to uh, mitigate that risk. So to that question, have we got over the worst of this? I'm afraid, no, we're not. I'm afraid that actually this is probably going to get darker before it gets lighter. There's a long, long way to go as regards this. So I will stop at that point. Um, thanks everybody for the attention this. I hope you found it very uh, useful and interesting. Uh, very challenging to go through all of that um, and give a whistle stop tour in 25 minutes, but hopefully I was able to give a flavor of the journey we've gone to, what we know, and what we still see as the risks in this area. So, with that, I'll uh, I'll stop and happily take any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I think we have time for about one question here. So, um, this current situation in terms of non-acceptability of the read across and the AIMS test, how serious is that? It's extremely serious. I mean, it, it's tantamount to playing a game of uh, Russian roulette in regards to this because your entire control strategy could be based on what you define either as a non mutagenic uh, N nitrosamine, in which case then you would control that as a normal impurity. If the regulator disagrees and says, well, you have to control the 26 nanograms, well, I mean, you know, the difference between those two numbers in terms of acceptable limits is orders of magnitude difference. And even if you define that it is mutagenic and it has to be controlled, but you define your own limit for this, in the case of Valencia, that's exactly what Pfizer did. They proposed what they believe is an, uh, an appropriate surrogate limit for the nitrosamine of uh, Valencia. And the regulators disagreed and imposed a much lower limit, which actually meant where Pfizer felt they had no risk, the regulators with their defined limit it automatically took it into the territory of there being a risk. So uh, on both counts, it's like roulette. And this is why we need much clearer guidance framework and more systematic guidance around how you do both read across and also what is an acceptable, um, you know, AIMS test or alternative. 